Well, good morning, Orchard Church. Man, it's such a privilege to get to see all of you again. I've been out of town the last couple Sundays. Uh, my family finally got to get a much, much deserved vacation. Uh, it's been four years since my last, like, true vacation. Um, and so it was such a delight for Miranda and I to get to go away and be gone for a week. Uh, we took a cruise uh, to the west coast of Mexico, the Baja Peninsula. Um, got to enjoy uh, some nice sunny days there. We took the the carnival ship, the panorama that you can see there, this monstrous cruise ship with a capacity over four, excuse me, 4,000 passengers uh, fit on this boat. And it was such a great week. Uh, lots of memories made, beautiful days enjoyed. Uh, got to enjoy nice sunsets, uh, got to hang out on the beach. Uh, we even played with some sea lions, uh, did a brunch on a yacht in Cabo. Um, this isn't to brag or have a commercial. I just want to let you know, thank you for letting me go and be gone for a week. Uh, but it's such an exciting privilege to get to be back with you guys and then get to preach on top of that because it's an incredible, incredible morning to me. You know, because I think about vacation, vacations just aren't the same if family's not there. Now, some of you, you may need vacation from your family. I understand this is not one of those times. Miranda and I took a vacation, and it was just the two of us. And in some ways, as great as the trip was, it felt like something was missing because we just didn't have the friends. We didn't have family with us. And so we were constantly having to meet people and make new friends and develop new family while we were there on that ship. And it was such a great time. But I will tell you, it was just a little bit remiss without some loved ones to enjoy it along with us. And so we've already had a few friends say next time we go, they want to join with us. So come on. Uh, I don't know when the next time will be, maybe another four years. But uh, just so you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. But as I think about vacations, today's message is not on cruise ships and vacations, by the way, but it is on family. Uh, because as you just saw a few moments ago, we got the incredible privilege uh, to recognize the Garcia Perez family and the Arnold family up here. Uh, and because they were coming forward today proclaiming to you guys um, that they want to be obedient to how God is leading and calling their family and dedicating the raising of their children to honor him. And church, they, they do that in front of you because they're looking for you to come alongside and encourage and support because that's what family looks like. Now, I don't know what your family may look like. Some of you, you may have a chaotic family like I do. We've got people all over from all over, and they're just spread out. I come from a huge family. I'm one of five, and my dad is one of five, and then his mom was one of 12. So I have cousins galore whenever it's family reunion time, Meanwhile, my wife is from a smaller family. Uh, it's just her and her sister, and then her parents were one of three. So, so they, they've got a much smaller size family get-togethers compared to my family get-togethers. And I don't know what your families are like, or maybe what vacations you took as a family. Maybe you did that annual camping trip, or maybe you went to the lake, or maybe you went to the beach or enjoyed some exotic place like Mexico, like we just got back from. But what's special about those family vacations is the memories, the experiences shared together. And I think about how wonderful it is when we can look fondly on those memories together and remember just really what family is supposed to be. Not all the stresses, not all the bickering and fighting, but recognizing the good times, the love and the joy that we have when we're around each other. And so this morning, as we talk about that, we're going to look in an encounter here just a minute with Jesus and his family and why it maybe doesn't look exactly how we expect it to, and yet there's something to be gained for all of us in the room, no matter what your family looks like. And so whether you come from a, a small country family, like my wife, we got a picture for you guys. This was us having lunch uh, at the roof just a few weeks ago. And so small family get together. Or if you're more like my side of the family, where it's just wild and crazy and large all the time, um, you can understand that. 
God has a perfect plan and design for family. And here's the deal. I don't know if you recognize this, but the first blank on your page today, and this is the key, the foundation of family is discipleship. The foundation of family, no matter whose family, is discipleship. Now, I'm not sure how you may define family. When I started looking up definitions of family, some of them were quite ambiguous, from as simple as just a group of people living together as a unit, whatever that means. Others just shared ancestry, or one definition was anybody who is blood-related or joined by marriage or adoption. It makes a little more sense, a little more encompassing. But even then, I feel like those definitions don't truly capture all that it means to be family. Because if we're honest here this morning, I don't think every one of us would say, yes, all of our family either lives with us, shares the same ancestors as we do, or we're married or share the same bloodlines. I think all of us would agree that we have people in our lives who are family but don't quite meet those criteria. So what does it mean to be a family? Well, I was trying to come up with a definition, and here's the things that I felt like were most critical to be a family. I think a family is two or more people that share a common pursuit of security for one another, support for one another, unconditional love for one another, And then last of all, teaching or accountability for one another. I think if you have those elements, that can constitute a family, whether or not you come from the same parents or from the same ancestors, or if you've been married or adopted in, I think that that can be family. And I know that may be a very basic definition, but when you consider what really is family, if you are a parent in the room, you care for your children. You look out for their safety and security. You provide for their needs. You certainly should give them unconditional love, but then sometimes forgotten, but maybe most importantly, you also give teaching and instruction, accountability and guidelines, discipline when needed. You see, family is discipleship. Imagine what the family would look like if after a child was born, the parents just left the child to neglect and said, I hope they figure it out on their own. No, they actually have laws against that sort of thing because we recognize how cruel and how weird that would be. We don't do that when it comes to family dynamics, but sometimes we in the church certainly do that with our spiritual family. Oh, I hope they'll figure it out. Let me, just, let me just pray for them privately and quietly, and I won't say anything. Or you parents, maybe you're like, I hope they make their own decision, but I'm not going to push too hard. I'm not going to share my faith with them. I want them to make their own decisions. My encouragement to you, all of you, because no matter what role you play in your family, you are a part of a family is to recognize that discipleship is at the foundation of your family. The question is just, how are you discipling them? And what are you discipling them towards? Are you discipling them towards Jesus? Maybe you're discipling them to become a good hunter or fisherman. Maybe you're discipling them to to know how to cook in the kitchen or clean house. But are you discipling them to be a lover of Jesus Christ and a follower of of his word. This morning, that is the challenge for us, because the Bible is quite clear. God's perfect plan is for discipleship to start first at home with the family. In fact, you can look all through scripture. There's several different verses that talk about training a child, disciplining a child, teaching them God's word. We would be here quite a bit longer if I were to try to cover all those verses this morning. And so for your benefit, I'm just going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 6 this morning. 
So you can take a look, Deuteronomy chapter 6. We're going to jump to Mark here in just a minute to see Jesus' encounter. But Deuteronomy chapter 6, we'll look at this one passage where God is quite clear on discipleship in the family. And so this is what Moses writes, beginning in verse 1. You see, these are the commands, decrees, and regulations that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. And you must obey them in the land your grant. Excuse me, in the land you are about to enter and occupy, and you and your children and grandchildren must fear the Lord your God as long as you live. If you obey all his decrees and commands, you will enjoy a long life. Listen closely, Israel, and be careful to obey, then all will go well with you. And you will have many children in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord God of your ancestors promised you. Now catch this, verses 4 and 5 are what is called the great Shema. Shema means listen, and they call it this because the first word you'll see here in verse 4, listen, listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God and the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home or when you're on the road, before you go to bed, and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands, wear them on your forehead as reminders. Even in verse 9, write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Moses emphasizes here in Deuteronomy 6 the importance of never forgetting who the Lord is and who he has called the people of Israel to be, to be his people, to be his family. And here in Deuteronomy, we see that there is a a edict, a demand for the people to make sure that this isn't just something that they know, but they transfer this knowledge. They make sure to instruct their children, their grandchildren, and future generations who may not have seen what it was like in the land of Egypt, who may not have known the goodness of God to deliver them through the Red Sea in the wilderness. And so they needed the parents and the grandparents and the generations before to instruct them, to disciple them. And so church, this morning, as you hear the words of the great Shema, this prayer of the people of Israel that reminds them again and again the importance of teaching their children, my question again to you, how are you discipling your family? What role are you Playing Because if there is no discipleship in the family, is it a healthy family? Is it a loving family? God makes clear that discipleship is the foundation. Here at the Orchard Church, we believe this very thing as well. This is why in our children's ministry and our student ministry, we practice what's called the orange strategy. The orange strategy is really quite simple. You see, we have the red, the heart of the home, the love of parents and family, meeting the yellow, the light of the church, of the gospel and the word of Jesus Christ. Yellow, red, coming together in partnership with one another creates orange. What this means is that in our kids' ministry and in our student ministry and everything we do, we want to encourage you families first to be the primary disciplers, to be the ones who are telling your kids about Jesus and helping them to understand the Bible. And we want to just come alongside and support and build you up as the disciplers in your home. This is why Miss Diane sends kids home with memory verses for you to help teach them and train them. This is why in student ministry, I'll send out parent emails saying for the next month, we're going to be talking about this subject material. And here's some discussion questions. Here's some ways that you can talk with your student and have conversation in car rides or over dinner about the gospel and what it means to them. Our encouragement is for you as a family to be actively involved in discipleship as God's design. 
Now, I told you we were going to get to Mark 3 because I want you to see Jesus has an encounter with his family. And on the surface, it may not appear as you and I might expect. It may even feel a little bit cold. And I want us to understand maybe why Jesus handles this a little bit differently. So let's take a look at Mark chapter 3, verses 31 through 35. So the gospel writes, Then Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him, and they stood outside and sent word for him to come out and talk with them. There was a crowd sitting all around Jesus, and someone said, Your mother and your brothers are outside asking for you. Verse 33, Jesus replied, Who is my mother, and who are my brothers? And then he looked at those around him and said, Look, these are are my mother and brothers. Anyone who does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Now, I want to reassure you, Jesus is not belittling his family. He's not neglecting them. Some of us might have this kind of response, but because we don't want to acknowledge our family, we don't want to respect them and say, yes, I belong to those people or they belong to me. Some of you parents, you do this in the supermarket. You tell your child to go one way and you go the other way. I don't know them, right? Jesus isn't doing that here. He's not disowning or somehow disrespecting his family, but rather Jesus is second blank on your page. Jesus, through faith in Christ, redefines our family. You see, long have been the the restrictions or the limitations that family was recognized because of your blood, because of who you come from, whose family you belong to. And Jesus, through his ministry and death on the cross, he redefines family to not be about What blood runs through your veins, but rather are you under the blood of the Lamb? And so this morning, as we talk about discipleship and family, I want you to understand, maybe you're here in the room and you're not a parent, a mother or a father. Maybe you're a grandparent or a neighbor. Maybe you've never really felt like you had a family and you feel like you're all alone. My encouragement to you this morning is is that Christ says that family is not defined by those terms, but rather family is simply defined as whether or not you are following him. Because if you are, you are part of God's bigger, more permanent family. A family of brothers and sisters that are filling this room. But also means that you have a responsibility. Not just to be a discipler in your own home, but to be a discipler to those all around you because each and every person you come in contact with either is or could potentially be your family now the Jews in that time they boasted in their family lines they took great pride in the fact that they were sons of Abraham you don't have to turn there but you can go later and look in John chapter 8 Jesus has a a terse encounter with the Pharisees where they brag that we're sons of Abraham and we know what we're doing. And Jesus goes, if you don't believe in me, you can call yourself sons of Abraham, but you're really sons of Satan. Strong, strong words for men who thought themselves to be of the family of God. Because the truth is, is that the Pharisees were more intent on on themselves than they were on discipling others. Jesus says, if you want to be part of his family, then you must follow the will of God. Paul says it this way in Ephesians chapter 1. He says, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, because we are united with Christ. Now catch this. Even before he made the world, God loved us. And he chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him 
great pleasure, Paul says. God took pleasure in bringing you into his family. And so Paul says, then our response in verse 6, So we praise God for the glorious grace that he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. For he is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son. And he forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us along with all the wisdom and understanding. Paul says that this is the gospel. This is why you and I can celebrate and rejoice today. This is good news. That it doesn't matter what tribe you come from. It doesn't matter who your parents are. It doesn't even matter what your nationality, how much money you have in the bank. All that God considers and concerns himself with is whether or not you are a child of God. His. And it says, He chose you. Before you took your first breath, before you took your first step, He chose you. It's not based on merit. It's not based on family bloodlines. It's not even based on whether or not you would deem yourself worthy. God, because He is gracious and merciful, has adopted you into his family. So here's the deal, church. We said discipleship, it's the foundation of the family. We've said Jesus has redefined the family, so now that you and I, if we are in Christ, we are a part of God's family. That means that you and I all have a responsibility to be disciple makers, to be growing not only as disciples, but be then developing little disciples around you, whether they're your kids, whether they're neighbors. Maybe you just get involved in helping out, passing out backpacks at Tower Road or serving in the children's or student ministry. There is what I would dare say three necessary components for discipleship. Three things that are a must if we are going to actually obey what Christ is calling us to do. And I want us to see them demonstrated in Mark chapter 3. You see, in just a few verses previous, Mark lines out Jesus' call to the disciples. And this is a very brief passage. So stay with me. But Mark 3, verses 13 through 19 say this. After Jesus went up on the mountain and called out to the ones he wanted to go with him, they came to him. And then he appointed the 12 of them and called them his apostles. They were to accompany him and he would send them out to preach, giving them authority to cast out demons. And these are the 12 he chose. Simon, whom he named Peter, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, but Jesus nicknamed them sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who would later betray him. A lot of us are familiar with this list. Some names more so than others. We see a good bit of encounters with the likes of James and Peter and John. We see lesser known disciples like James, son of Alphaeus. We don't, we don't get a whole lot of James, uh, lesser James in scripture. But here's the deal. All of them were chosen and all 12 were called to follow. And here's the deal. I told you there are three necessary components for discipleship. The first one that you need to understand, discipleship demands a commitment. Discipleship demands a commitment. Now, it's easy and obvious for us to say, well, yes, the disciples were committed. They chose to answer Jesus' call. But let me also point out, Jesus had a commitment to the disciples as well. Jesus, in choosing them, says, I will invest in you. 
I will pour into you for the next three years. He doesn't explicitly say three years, but we know his ministry is three years. He says, I'm going to build a relationship with you where I'm going to teach you and equip you so that way you can then go out in my authority, preaching, casting out demons, doing all the things that I have showed you. Jesus had a commitment to the 12. You, as disciple makers, you have a commitment to those that you disciple to love them, invest in them, provide accountability, even hard conversation when necessary. But you also as a disciple have a commitment to follow. You see, the disciples had to choose to no longer stay in the crowd, to no longer follow when it was comfortable, to just move with everybody else. But Jesus called them to something deeper, something more intentional. Church, if we are going to be a disciple-making family, then it's going to require commitment that's intentional on our part, intentional to love and embrace, intentional to provide support, and sometimes even sacrifice. Sometimes our commitment is to trust God even when we don't have the answers or don't see the bigger picture. Many of you know our story, but there's some new faces in the room, so I'll share briefly. So my wife and I came to the Orchard Church in January of 2022. We came really on faith. You see, I was serving as a youth pastor in North Mississippi at a great church there in Oxford, and we loved it. We had great family. We had a great house. Things just seemed perfect. Miranda had just finished or was going to be finishing her first year uh, at school there, and all things seemed to be just in alignment with our plans. And then out of the blue, as we were praying, God led us both to the same reality, that we needed to be ready to move. And we didn't know why, we didn't know where, we just knew that that was clear what God was telling us to do. And he wanted us to say yes, even though we didn't know why. And so we began to prepare and just search, okay, God, where are you leading? And I came across the job listing for here at the Orchard Church. Now, we had no connection to this church, didn't know anybody, had no relation here. The only thing that really was a connecting point was that I had taken students to Global Youth Camp, where Steve had previously served, and Larry Lynch, the administrator here, went to the same college I did. That was the only two connections that I had to start our lives here was that. And yet, when we prayed and sought the Lord, not knowing why or how, but knowing this, this is what God was calling us to do, we committed to say yes and trust. And here we are. You may not always see the bigger picture. You may not always understand that Jesus is calling you to commit to follow him just as he is committed to teach and equip and train you. Will you say yes to him? Maybe this morning you are a disciple and you are committed. Let me ask you this. A second thing that discipleship demands is community. Community. Now I'll tell you that since coming here, our family's been blessed. We have found family here. And we are excited to be a part of what God is doing here at the Orchard But I'll tell you, our family isn't just all of you here in this room, but there are some special people. You see, because with serving with our student ministry, we've gotten to know some incredible teenagers. And I'll tell you that community happens and develops when you start serving. When you start plugging in and loving on people and putting others ahead of yourself. It doesn't have to be with students. But man, we've got a great student ministry on Wednesday nights with over 50 students. And it's not because we're the coolest church in town. It's not because we're doing anything special, not playing the funnest games. We're just authentic. We just tell them the truth and we're real with them. And kids buy into that. They understand that. They want to be a part of that because it's genuine community. Let me ask you, church, do you have genuine community Can you say right now that there are people that you know deeply and they know you deeply? There are also some other really special people in the room today. We're part of a life group, an incredible life group, some of them in there in the back. 
And I'll tell you that they are family to us. But not because we just have read books together, not because we've played board games and gone out to eat, but because we've lived life. We've gone through struggle together. We've shared hurt together and been vulnerable when we're not always doing what we need to do. We've prayed for each other and cried together. That's community. There are a lot of faces here in this room this morning, and maybe you're new or you're just trying to figure out what the orchard is like. Let me encourage you, get involved in a life group. Find real community where you open yourself up and be transparent about who you are. That's where real discipleship happens, is when you allow iron to actually sharpen iron. Sometimes it's not always comfortable. Sometimes we have to have hard conversations in life group, but that's okay because we can be honest and real with each other. Later on, we are going to be recognizing some special kids who are achieving milestones. They have graduated out of preschool going into kindergarten or graduating out of fifth grade going into sixth grade and it's such a special time for them because they've kind of graduated and they move to that next thing families how many of you have just stayed where you're at your mode of discipleship is to be in the exact same spot you were when you got saved that would seem quite peculiar and, and, and absurd, really. We wouldn't expect a 10-year-old to still necessarily be in preschool. We would hope that they have graduated out and they're now done with fifth grade, getting ready to move into middle school. And yet, church, let's be honest, we sometimes find ourselves discipleship-wise in the exact same spot we've been for years, not growing and not changing. And I think it's because we've lacked commitment and we haven't gotten in with real community. You see, Jesus invited the apostles not just to follow him, but he invited them to a relationship to accompany him as he showed them what it looked like to follow God. You, as a disciple maker, don't have to have all the answers, but you have to be willing to let people in and show them what you're doing and how you're following Jesus. Lastly, discipleship should lead somewhere. You should be going someplace, teaching and growing. Discipleship actually should matter. And whether you actually sit down and write out goals for yourself, or maybe you just are recognizing that, hey, I need to step up. I need to get on a serve team. I need to become a leader of a group. Maybe I just need to take the first step of starting a relationship with Jesus. Whatever your milestone is, whatever your growth step is, let me encourage you this. The third component of discipleship is discipleship must lead to commissioning. Now, here's what I mean. Jesus didn't just invite the disciples to become his friends. He invited them to follow for a purpose so he could then send them out to build the church. This morning, my church family, you are the body of Christ. If you are here today and you've accepted him as Lord, and he is calling you to follow him so he can then commission you and send you but I think, church, we struggle the most with this because we like to sit and learn where it's comfortable. Commissioning means we have to get up, stretch our legs a little bit, and go. And so the church this morning, as you think about your role in your family, let me ask you, are you truly committed? Are you engaging in community? And are you being commissioned to be sent out? Maybe you're a parent here this morning. You're training your kids to eventually leave the nest. You're hoping that they grow and become independent so that they can have a family of their own. Disciples of Christ, God wants to use you so he can send you so you can go and make more disciples. Are you being faithful to that calling as a part of his family to go and to disciple others? Let's pray together.